our keynote speaker today is the founder, president, chief executive officer of Coscaris Group. He started Coscaris Motors as a one-man business. And over the years, he has transformed the organization into an indigenous conglomerate with diverse interests in agriculture, banking, manufacturing, ICT, and automobile sector of the Nigerian economy. From very humble beginnings, Dr. Cosmos Madoka has been able to build a colossal business empire which cuts across almost every critical sector of the nation's economy. From importation and distribution to manufacturing, information tech, agriculture, real estate, and car assembly. He is today an icon in the Nigerian automobile industry as he is regarded as the benchmark for other operators in the industry. This reflected in Coscaris Motors being appointed as sole dealer for notable luxurious brands like Rolls Royce, BMW, Mini, Jaguar, Land Rover, and Ford Motor Companies in Nigeria, and Abro Auto Care Products from the US. Dr. Maduka, through his pet project, Coscaris Foundation has awarded numerous scholarships which, are, which have enabled in indig indigents but bright students to pursue their life ambitions in various institutions of higher learning. In recognition of his outstanding qualities, experience, and contributions to the education, business, and commercial landscape, he was awarded Honorary Doctor of Business Administration by the University of Nigeria in 2003 and Distinguished Fellowship of the Nigerian Law School in 2004. He is a fellow of African Business School member of Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria, as well as Institute of Directors, Nigeria. In September 2012, he was conferred with the national honor of the Commander of the Order of the Niger, CON. On October 21, 2016, he was again honored by the Afe Babalola University with another honorary Doctor of Business Administration, Honoris Causa. It was also afforded, awarded the Fate Model Entrepreneur of the Year in 2011. He will be delivering the keynote address today titled Building for Scale. Ladies and gentlemen, please, with a very warm round of applause, let us bring up together Dr. Cosmos Madoka. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Please sit down. Um, <clears throat> let me quickly acknowledge uh, Adeinka, the executive director of Faith Foundation and the chairman planning committee, Olushegun. It's a great honor and a real privilege for me to be here this morning with you. You must have had them reading that uh, citation as if they are reading my obituary. <laughs> if you truly want to understand, the guy standing before you is a young man that believed in himself and had no formal education because of the death of his father. Forget about all those doctorate degree, but if you do things right, the thing you are looking for will pursue you. Some of us are here now to understand how to run business. If we understand that business requires offering service and we stop pursuing money and pursue service rendering, money will pursue us as a reward for the services we have given. Um, I didn't go to school, but by the things I've achieved, doctorate degree has continued to pursue me. So I then make decisions, the ones to choose and the ones not to choose. Um, at least I've had about six of them. I accepted only two. Because I also would like to know the person honoring me. What has he achieved before he put an honor on me? Let's go straight to today's business. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And many thanks to Faith Foundation for inviting me to be a special guest of honor and a keynote speaker in this special event. 
may I first take the opportunity to formally welcome you to this year's Faith Foundation annual conference. I trust that all the alumni that have gone through the special entrepreneur program by Faith Foundation have achieved significant level of success in their various business, businesses. As an entrepreneur doing business in Nigeria, I am passionate about the opportunity around us for agri from agriculture, banking, automobile, technology, technology, tech communication, real estate, and technology industries. I am particularly thrilled at the good work Faith Foundation has been doing over the years. I am delighted to speak on the team building for scale. So let us define scale. If we do not know exactly what we mean or what we are looking for, how will we know when we found it? Oxford Dictionary described scale as to climb as as to climb to the top of something that is high and difficult to climb. I am I would like to start by making us understand the basic of what we mean by building for scale. To grow our business at a high level that is difficult to attend is a subject that is very dear in my heart because as a young man, I was very ambitious. Coming from a background where no one gave me chance of survival, but I was hungry, truly hungry, because of the death of my father at the age of four. My mother was left as a single parent with four kids. I happened to be the second in the family. And it was not long before the Nigeria Civil War broke out. We did not have enough to eat. My sibling and I fought over food, not meat. So to build a scale, one must develop a hunger mentality. I desire to climb to the top against all and desire to climb at the top against all odds. I had worked for my uncle for seven years without salary because these are some of the things we want to be discussing this morning. I'm sure some of you must have read the book, uh, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Robert Koizaki said, don't work for money, work to learn. I had done apprenticeship for my uncle for seven years and where I earned no money. He clothed me and fed me. I used to sleep in a shop at the Imbo bus stop at the Butemeta 88 Griffith Street. And uh, early in the morning, some young men will wear short necker, white up and down, and will close their hand like this and look at me and laugh and say, hey, look at him, a rat shop. And one day I put my hand in my mouth. I said, look at you. <laughs> Five years today, I'll be better than you. So that was the university I went. Seven years, I earned no money. But at the end of that seven years, my uncle gave me 200 naira in 1976. And that was my stewardship for seven years. My senior brother was of opinion that I leave the money and let us go home. But I asked him if he did have anyone to give me when we get home. I took the 200 naira with a different mindset, with that hunger mentality. I could have spent it in a restaurant that evening, blame everybody around me for what has gone wrong in my life, including blaming God and asking why did he take my father when I was four years. But I have a different mindset, and that's what I want you to get part of the things I'm talking about this morning. So, with a vision to build an institution that will be timeless in its relevancy. Because Charis mission is to deliver excellent product and services to its customer, giving them the highest value for their money. And as part of the company's corporate social responsibility, it will plow back resources into immediate and larger society while ensuring that the, 
that the employees have a sense of pride and fulfillment. As I have shared in various forum and in my book, as an ambitious young man, growing up, I dream of building an institution that will be capable of then Leventis Group and UAC. They were the reigning company of our days. The level of growth God has allowed, enabled us to attain today in Costaris can be traced to that early life dream. And not surprising, the vision of Costaris as an organization to build an institution that, that will be timeless in its relevancy eventually paid off. As an, um, as an interesting thing about dream is that at first, it will appear unattainable, like a castle in the sky. But experience has shown that with dogged determination, unwavering commitment, and divine providence, a lawful dream can be achieved even in the face of daunting challenges. What is important is to learn the patience to go through the process to become rich and embrace the culture of hard work and engagement in legitimate business that demand determination to achieve success. With understanding that enduring success is not a product of chance or unplanned leadership, they are characterized by a clear vision and a growth strategies actualized through organizations and effective leadership. Sir Wilson Churchill said, it is not enough that we do our best sometime, but we have to do what is required. Doing business requires capital, and capital can be defined as resource. So, one must learn how to utilize resources for sustainable development. There are three fixtures, there are three main fixtures characterized in the world, resources. One, resources provide value or are seen as valuable. Two, resources are scarce, that is limitedly available. And three, Resources have potential to be depleted, meaning, meaning resources has a tendency to be used up much faster than it can be replenished. These characteristics of resources are what give, right, give rise to the term resource utilization. That is simply, that in simple terms means the most efficient and effective use of available resources to achieve a desired result. That is to say, how well a person or organization or a country employs its resources to achieve a desired result or outcome. Building for scale, in my humble opinion, is building a sustainable business. The question, that, the question that this team posed on us then is, what foundation have we built for a business and how can it achieve sustainability? The matter, the matter in today's business is innovate or die. Innovation, on the other hand, is driven by having the right talents on hand. Today's new products and services are being rendered absolute, more bigger than ever. To stay ahead, small organizations must then simply become more adventurous and entrepreneurial in their thinking, more nimble in their execution, new strategies and driven by entrepreneurial culture. From this premise, we highlight the following key defined controls which small businesses must imbibe early in 
life of the organization to achieve a sustainability in the future without caving in or capping their growth. This includes setting a clear vision. That's what I've already addressed for your organization. Setting a clear vision, setting a clear organizational uh, objective, talents, and employee recruitment innovation, positive organization culture, making software product and services, strong corporate governance, regulatory compliance and financial accountability, and talent making strategies. One, a clear vision, a mission statement, an entrepreneur must be clear in what, in what it is that he planned to accomplish with his business and must be able to capture it in concise and unambiguous written language for others who will come to share in his vision to understand and run with. This must be reinforced rotationally within the organization and internalized by the stake by the stakeholders in the in order to actual in, in order to actualize within its given time. Const two, constant research for talent. Whereas a business starts with the entrepreneur, who is the chief promoter of the business, and a handful of support staff who may either be relevant or who may be either be a relative or hired staff who believe in the vision of the promoter. At some point in the growth of the business, it must begin to admit additional workforce. When we started in Costaris, I am the A to Z of that company. Many of us started differently. Some of you have some capital and some people have get you together to put money together for you to run the business. But the experience I'm sharing with you is how I started. My boss gave me 200 naira in 1975, a very small amount of money. So capital is not all that is required to do business. The knowledge you have in the business for me is played over 60% equation on what it requires to be successful in the things we are going to do. Um, my excitement was not 200 naira. My excitement was that I can do with my life what I want to do from that day. I knew I was no more under anybody's tutorage. So my senior brother felt he went to school. My mother supported him. Uh, he went to secondary school while I stopped in elementary three for hardship. It was hard for my mother to cope. But my excitement that day is that I'm going to put into work everything I have learned. I've always been waiting for that time. So when it came, I just felt so happy. I looked at my uncle. I said, Uncle, you knew I served you well. I think I deserve better than what you gave me. But you know, in business, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiated for. I didn't negotiate nothing with my uncle. Because in those days and in the kind of apprenticeship scheme that is this, you just go to be the best behaved boy or you get nothing. So for me, I still today advocate that apprenticeship is a way to go. It's the best university any young man or woman will go. Because you will learn unprecedented discipline that can carry you in life. If you mess up, you are sent back in the following day. And there's no law court anybody is going to appeal your case. So you go to be at your base behavior. So 200 naira was my stewardship, but I was happy. I look at my uncle, I said, five years from today, if you have what I've done out of this 200 naira, you will be amazed. I thank God he repeated that he was not surprised, he believed I'm going to succeed. I said, thank you very much. 
I went and team up with my senior brother and we formed a company called Umba the Cap Brothers. It wasn't long, within six months, we started defiling in ideology. Life is all about mindset, the way you think, the, the way you think. It's not just enough that you come to business school or learn entrepreneur. I also have to think that entrepreneurship is a core, something that bubbles in your heart. The mind to be different, to you need to challenge status quo. You need to answer questions. You need to be inquisitive in your thinking. Is there a better way to do something? It's not only what they teach you in school. While I was working for my uncle, I did the research, not in a formal way, the way some of you did it in the university. I did a research in an informal way. I was able to know that there is something in Honda C75 that can fit on on Bentley motorcycle. I deserve better than what you get. But you know, in business, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiated for. I didn't negotiate nothing with my uncle because in those days and in the kind of apprenticeship scheme that is this, you just want to be the best behaved boy or you get nothing. So. For me, I still today I forget that apprenticeship is a way to go. It's the best university any young man or woman will go. Because you will learn unprecedented discipline that can carry you a life. If you mess up, you are sent back in the following day. And there's no law for anybody is going to appeal your case. So you want to be at your base behavior. So 200 Naira was my stewardship. When I was happy, I looked at my uncle and said, Five years from today, if you have what I've done out of this 200 naira, you will be amazed. I thank God, you know, protect that he was not surprised to live and going to succeed. I said, Thank you very much. I went and team up with my senior brother and we formed a company called the Cap Brothers. It wasn't long, within six months, we started dividing the ideology. Life is all about mindset, the way you think, the, the way you think. It's not just enough that you come to business school or learn entrepreneur. I also have to think that entrepreneurship is a core, something that bubbles in your heart. The mind to be different, to, you need to challenge status quo, you need to answer questions, you need to be inquisitive in your thinking. Is there a better way to do something? It's not only what they teach you in school. While I was working for my uncle, I did the research, not in a formal way, the way some of you did it in the university. I did a research in an informal way. I was able to know that there is something in Honda C75 that can fit on on Bentley motorcycle. I was able to know there's something in the 504 that can fit in Volkswagen. And I was taking a lot of those things. Those are the, my greatest asset, not the 200 Naira. So when my uncle eventually gave me 200 Naira, and physically every hope should be lost, I was excited. Within six months, I couldn't agree with my senior brother on some of the things to do. We separated the company. And by then, my capital was only 316 Naira. And I went on my own to start building the institution today that you know as Oscaris Group. What did I do? I got a boy, the same thing I was trained under, to get a young man who is going to work for you, and I got some young men who supported me, and they worked with me. I entered my course from Newe to come to Lagos here. Difficult lifestyle, you know, you enter a, a, what we call 911. Some of you are not born and may not have an idea what the kind of thing I'm talking about. It's a vehicle that has no, no, you, your leg cannot touch down. You are suspended in the bench of the seat. So when the, the vehicle enter car, you are thrown up and you can fall on the ground. If it's raining, they use tarpaulin to cover all of you and then let somebody mess there, you are your own. Uh, 
Under this kind of atmosphere, you can't fool around. You just need your head need to be correct. I started earning small money, but the ambition I have, I'm talking about vision now, was I was applying that money back in the business. Whatever I did not have in the office, I do not need it in my home. It was not a need at all. My goal as a young man starting business is that I said, God help me that I grow my business to a point where anything a customer is looking for will be available in my store. And that is, I had an equal eye on capital, reinvesting every money I earn back into that business. Are you still following me? Okay, fine. Maybe this may not be what you expect this morning, but you need if you needed something more, maybe you should have called back to Tony or <laughs> some other people to or uh, Mazio who happened back to tell you some of those things. But I'm telling you one I learned in the streets that can be useful for your business. One of the most difficult jobs of a business owner is to constantly ensure that he has the right people at the right job. I, the most difficult thing to do when you start the way I start is when you come to, when you need to make a curve or a corner that will make the difference in your life. Because individuals like me that are very determined to succeed and make success can get to a point and cap their success. And that is to say, you've made enough money, but there is a time you need to bring experts into your business to help you grow and make a different, the proper structure in a way you can compete in a structural manner that banks will take you serious and many big players in the industry will take you serious. But many self-made entrepreneur got at that point and they felt, what would these people offer me? These people that went to school. A typical woman will tell you what a man have in his pocket is more important than anything. But I can tell you authoritatively that what somebody have up here is greater than what you have in your pocket. <laughs> so, to really be a good person is not laying the wall that matter. It's when you get to a point of making a corner. How successful you lay the corner wall, they will say you're a good person. And this was one of my major challenge to know when to stop the usual traditional way of what other people that before me. Till my time, everybody in my village get boys to train them, to help them to learn the business. When you bring a boy, a young boy, and start teaching him what to do, by the fifth year, that boy is already mature. He knew all the ins and outs of the business. The training I had was such that your boss will import goods and he will cut off the letterhead and the, so that you don't know where the goods is coming from. The consignment will come. He will put the prices of the goods for you to sell without you knowing the, the cost price of the goods. So initiative is completely, um, you know, kill. You are micromanaged. Just this is the price to sell the goods. So you can only argue to get more or stop at that point. But for me, it was faulty because I knew something was bubbling in me and I believe if I'm allowed to make a decision, I can make good decisions that will be give the company a better profit than what they are earning. So I started taking this first set of boys. In my own generation, they will bring you, by the time you are 50 or 60 years, where you're supposed to be valuable to the company, they will give you capital and set you up. By this time, the boss come late in the office, he will always come by 11 o'clock, and by 4 he goes back home because he's the boss, and all the customers know the young boys. So you see a system 
that lasts only for seven, eight years. One champion who is the biggest importer or motorcycle pass dealer. After eight years, the man starts going down. Another young person starts coming up. By the next eight years, he starts going down. So when I started, I said, Shay, this is the wrong thing to do. I took the first set of boys, and as soon as I settled the first set of boys, I said, I'm not going to go this system that I was brought up under. I'm going to get people here to bake, bake a big cake that everybody will take a part from it. So, this is the most important thing. Many self entrepreneurs will not want to do that because we are bringing people who are going to be asking you questions, challenging your assumptions, and making you to think a little bit deeper than you've thought before. So I started hiring staff. And people say, what is this guy doing? The, each of those first set of boys I have, once they're matured, I settle them, I replace them with a staff. And the, because initially, I am the managing director, I am the backward director, <laughs> I am the accountant, I am the chief uh, of financial officer, I am the HR, I am the damaging and managing director, the backward and the, the, uh, the clearing and forwarding agent. I am A to Z on that topic. But I knew I was stressing myself because where my core competence is, is my knowledge in the interest of all motorcycle spear parts, what to bring and what to sell. But I do not have all the knowledge of financial background to structure a book. But I have basic financial knowledge because you can't do that without being business. Before I employed anybody, which is something you must also know, if you don't have all the capital to, to build a big business, there are basic four things you must have. One is what you call, if you are a trader, because some of you are not, but let me take it. If you're a trader, you must have what you call purchase book. Purchase book is where you record every goods that you, you bought for sale. The day you buy them and the prices you, 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 you pay for them. Then you must have another book that is called sales book. Sales book is where you record everything you sell each day. Then you have another book that you call expenses book. That means you must make, the, you have to hold yourself accountable. If I enter bus, I write it down. I don't dip hand inside my pocket and spend money. Every, in each day I will tell you I've spent 300 Naira or I spent only 75 Kobo, whatever it is. So in each day I'm able to know what are the goods I sold, what profit did I make on it, what are my total expenditure, and what is the income? I do this on a daily basis. If for any reason I check my cash in the end of the day, I wasn't a banker then, I didn't know, I, wasn't, I told you I stopped with my rent a trade. But these are basic fundamental um, uh, prerequisites for business. If at the end of the day I find out I, I had 25,000 and the things that I've recorded that I sold, are only 18,000. I need to find what did I sell that this extra 7,000 is here because 7,000 cannot jump by air to enter into my record. There must have been goods I sold that I did not record. And if I don't know how much goods I sold, because at the end of the day, after a daily activity, I take the sales book and get to my stock book. In this page of this stock book, I wrote, if I'm selling an article, say mail, on December uh, 12, 9, uh, 2017, I purchased 100 things of mail. So in January 15, I sold 25 things. I must come to the stock book and minus it. The balance is now 75. This is how you will be able to know if your goose is missing or if your boys are stealing from you. We do this when the customers have left and balances all the book before we go home. You are not ready to go to this difficult accounting structure. You are not ready for business and you can never build for scale. So this basic knowledge, you must have them before you even employ experts to come and help you. Because you also need to ask experts some questions that will help them 
to understand you are not completely novice in the things you are talking about. Otherwise, they can take things over your head and plan for you to where you can also crash that without you knowing. So, but if you have those knowledge, when they ask certain things, you ask them questions and say, but what happened if the other one happened? Your, your knowledge is limited, but they have the discipline to at least explain to you that you are on the right course. So these are things we did. Then we started bringing experts into the company who help us structure the company the way it should be. Because those number of years they spent in university was not for nothing. They also were taught basic things, the way to run a business in a professional manner. Where a bank can take you serious, where you can have a book that you'll be able to, a financial that you can present to, to your creditors to be able to help you to do business. These are the system on what we did in Costaris because these are really the secret. I learned before I got anybody to join me in Costaris, I paid myself salary. In the salary I paid myself, I give my wife money for feeding for, for our household. And I also hold my wife accountable for the money I give her. If she's going to cook a soup, I tell her, can you give me a list of what you want to buy? No, this is serious. And she will give me a list. And in the list, she will write a bottle of oil, a tin of this and that. I'll give her money. And then after two weeks, she tells me she's cooking another soup. I said, can I have a list? And if I see a bottle of oil, I said, ah, yeah, well, two weeks ago, you took your money for oil. Why are you writing an oil again? You may think, is this crazy? I'm helping her also to teach her accountability and a life of, not to live a life of wastages. You can't throw things away. She needs to explain what happened to the oil we bought two weeks ago. Even though oil is not as it's a Coca Cola that you have drank, drank it, but if you have gone through poverty, the one I went through, you must be your your eyes must be sharp on every angle, looking for everything. Today, this lady I'm talking to you is the vice president of Costaris, <clears throat> and have a credit card that has no limit. But the foundation has to be laid right, eh? Okay. So these are some of the street smart that I am here to share with you. These are some of the basic things we did. Keep an eagle eye on the cash. Another problem with we Africans, especially Igbo people where I came from, is that we are loquacious people. And once we start having money come, then we have arrived syndrome we sit on. That's the kind of thing I tell you for those bosses who came by 11 o'clock and by 4, they left office. Their business become a little secondary. They are the people who come very late in the office and go early. Then leaving the, the, the business now in somebody's hand that it won't be long, they are going to set that person up and that person start going up and they start going down and they can freely put money in their pocket and spend. And village friends and everybody will come because once success grow, you see success has many friendships. People come and say, oh, God, things are going well. We have a culture that if you need to cry, we make you cry. I don't spend money, I do not earn. We have seven world-class brands under our, our institution. We manufacture Ford. We assemble Ford trucks today in Nigeria. Several things we, 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 we do, but business is like a, a wire fire. If you succeed, it ignites to the second thing and you continue to, 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 to move on. Um, today, we borrow a Nigerian bank on a negative pledge. I didn't pick it on the street. When I grew up as a young man, I knew one of the most scarce commodity in Nigeria is integrity. And I knew to be able to succeed that I need to utilize this very well. And I started working with the Japanese who taught me integrity, not church, not mosque. The Japanese 
commit suicide if they make a promise to you and they cannot keep it, they take their life and write you a letter of apology and say they are sorry they disappointed you. There is no explanation good enough for them not to keep their promise. A Japanese is happy to hear that the roof of your house caved in, but you met a payment obligation of yesterday, as you say you would do. But Nigeria will say, I won't kill myself. One of my friends I took to Japan, said, I can get the Japan said, please kill yourself. <laughs> because you promise. It's honorable for him to know you died because you don't keep your promise. You say, what am I teaching you? I'm teaching you how to commit suicide. But it's teaching you to know that you cannot compromise integrity. As a matter of fact, you are not rich until people can trust you. Anything you think you are doing is baseless. But this is where I found a ripple that this is a scarce commodity in Nigerian business environment. And the, the Japanese taught me that and I worked hard. And I started securing suppliers' credit, which is better for you than borrowing from bank. Bank money has interest, Saturday, Sunday, Friday, public holiday. And they will ask you to bring your grandfather, your mother-in-law, the baby in your womb as a corotara to be able to give you the money. So, and now if you don't have a basis, you have not had a established, tested business and you go to borrow money from the bank, it's the easiest way to commit suicide. Because the little you have will disappear and the one you are trying to get, you will not get. So, you need to learn that bank borrowing, you can only leverage on it but you can't plan your business on bank bullying. Bank bullying will be, will be only 20% or if, if I think it can be only 10 or 15% of what you require to do your business. The real thing is for you to build your own capital or get supplier's credit. When I discovered this, many people thought I, I was a, a magician because I got the Japanese to trust me. The Japanese don't trust you easily. They are like diesel engine, difficult to start. But when they start, they can carry you through any mountain. They are not Americans. Americans are gasoline. They easily crack. But the Japanese will have a meeting with him. He will not receive you in his office. He will meet you in a coffee shop. First of all is that he's going to watch you to see how you keep time. Another thing, we Nigerians are bankrupt about it. When I got this invitation, they said it's 9 o'clock. I make sure that I am here at least 10 minutes before 9. A Japanese will stay around coffee shop. When it is exactly that time, he makes like this. Then you, you, give him, you made a promise to him that you are meeting by 9 o'clock, and by 9.45, you are not yet there. You already fell in the text because he's making up his mind how to deal with you that your promise is inshallah, you know, just as God wants it. Or God has to be blamed but you put the blame on some other thing. These are prerequisite. People sometimes observe you, the things you do, how you keep your promise from the time you say you will come. Not even money. Make a whole lot of difference. When people know they can take your word for it, there's no limit to where they can trust you. Today, I work with all these world-class brand names on open account. BMW ship me cars without any payment from me. Ford Motor, 200 years old company, does that. Jaguar Land Rover. In fact, all our principal around the world, we don't, the, the least credit we accept is 45 days from the date of payment. But we stretch it to some product to 270 days payment terms. Some of them, 80 days payment terms. A Japanese was asked question during the person that wrote my book, Ambassador Odon, said, how do I meet up with payment? He told him, because Charlie's payment arrive like Shinkansen. Shinkansen is a Japanese express train that they tell you it's going to come by 9 o'clock. Five minutes to 9, you won't see it. Two minutes to 9, you won't see it. Exactly 9 o'clock, you see the, the train. It never makes one minute. It will arrive exactly on time. When you build this situation, this is why if every business person or banker want to lend you money because they want to grow their business through your business. 
but they cannot lend you money if they don't think they can take your word for it. They need to give you money if they see you already doing something, something they can feel and touch, and they know each time you made a promise with them that that thing you said is, is as good as they can go home and sleep. So I grew up dreaming that I want to do business and God help me that I will not find any good business I will do. Let it be that I will not have money. You know, this ambition is like saying you want to be self-sufficient. You want to be like God. A man who has no financial need, what more does he need? And today, by the grace of God, I have not found any business we want to do and we didn't find cash to do it. So, you need to be clear in your mind what do you really want to achieve and work towards them. You don't get them by wishing so or thinking so. You pay for it. Climbing to, building to, to the scale is, 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 build, is climbing to something high that is difficult to attain. Your vision must be clear and you must tax yourself by the commitment you make to achieve the goals you want to achieve. You require three things to succeed in life. Vision, which I have explained. Clear vision. You must see it before anybody see it. There is only one believer for a vision. It's not you and your wife seeing it at the same time. And sometimes, if people don't say you are crazy, the vision is not correct vision. Second is faith to believe in your vision. And third is courage. Courage is not an absence of fear, but ability to act in the face of danger. You must be courageous to, to take risk, calculated risk, not baseless risk. But you can't, it was a risk for me to leave the norm, having a warehouse in Ajegule and buying a Mercedes car, and everybody will say, I have arrived. It was a risk for me to bring experts to come in and start telling me, oh guy, you are wrong. This will not happen. So today we build a business, sustainable business, from a business that is unregulated. We created a company where meaningful people, people can leave their work at bank and join us. Today I have an executive director that worked in a bank for 12 years working with me. I have a, a general manager of a bank, I, we today can get people to leave Lafarge and join Coscharis because we've been able to build a decent business where people can make a proper livelihood. And I can assure you it is possible for every one of you. You are on the right track, but just, be, just understand that you require determination. It's not going to be easy. I'm telling you a story like this, it looks like once you just start, you will reach there overnight. There was a time I was tempted like throwing in towel. But my vision, I saw something, and I, you're never going to stop. That vision is what is going to drive you. You're never going to stop until you get to where you plan to go. God bless you. Thank you. I hope the few things I say was meaningful and useful for you. Thank you very much, sir. I believe this is an ovation well deserved, very well deserved. Uh, you have given me a very good run for my money. Because when I introduced myself, I only said that my name is 16 Oniru. I didn't mention that I am a stand-up comedian. And I have not made anybody laugh yet. But you have made us laugh. So we thank you for that. Um, I was able to pick one or two things from everything that you shared, and I'm sure that all of us have picked one thing or the other as well. I have learned that capital is not all you need for business. The knowledge of the business is very key. And that in business, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiated for. When I introduced him, I said, Dr. Cosmos Maduka, someone was asking me when I went to sit down that she was having eye issues, that she would like to consult him. Please, he is not a medical doctor. <laughs> he is not a medical doctor. 
I went to school and graduated as a microbiologist. I graduated from Babcock University, and I wanted to further my education in medicine so that I would become a medical doctor. And then I had a very nasty encounter with my own doctor that changed my life forever. I went to see my doctor, and you know that in Nigeria, medical doctors have the most illegible handwriting ever. I went to see my doctor. I told him how I was feeling. As I was talking, he brought out a white sheet of paper, and he started scribbling things down. By the end of five minutes, I was done. He was at the bottom of the page. He said, 16 Oniru, to know what I will prescribe for you, let me just do a recap of everything that I have written. He started reading from the top, and the man got to the center of the sheet, and he could not see his own handwriting. <laughs> so he carried the same paper and was showing me, my brother, please help me check, what did I write in this place? <laughs> so I said to him, if you can't see your handwriting, how would I be the one to see it? So two weeks after that, he called me, and he said that his, doc his daughter was getting married. He wanted me to be the MC at the wedding. So I came to his office and we discussed. I told him my price and he tried to negotiate because I'm, I'm his patient. So we agreed on 500,000 Naira. And the mistake I made was that I allowed him to write the check. He wrote the check for me. I took it to the bank and they could not see his handwriting. So when I told them that it was a doctor that wrote it, they referred me to the pharmacy. <laughs> so I'm here to get my check. Ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned earlier that I'm not going to be the only one hosting you today. I have a co-MC, and she's here now. And she would also be inviting the moderator of the Q&A session with Dr. Maruka. Please help make welcome Miss Ayoyinka Delumo. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Please excuse my tardiness. Um, good morning, sir. That was an amazing speech. Um, I learned a lot from Dr. Maduka, including being on time. So <laughs> next time, I'm going to make sure that I'm on time. All right, so we're going straight into the question and answer session. It's going to be for 30 minutes. And um, you have little post-it notes um, in your file. So if you can please write down your questions that you have for Dr. Maduka, we would really appreciate that. Um, we want it to be as interactive as possible, so please do send in your questions. Okay, so moving on. I would like to introduce our moderator for this question and answer session, Abimbola Aze. Mona Lisa Abimbola Aze is the founder and chief executive officer of Mona Matthews, a company founded in 2002, which produces handmade shoes with matching bags for women, as well as high quality leather footwear for men. They also offer bespoke services as well as ready-to-wear shoes in a variety of colors, styles, ex exotic fabric, excuse me, and leather materials. She graduated from the Aspiring Entrepreneurs Program, AEP Class 4. Please, can we give a warm welcome for Abimbola Aze? While we're waiting for her to come up, can I please mention that we have two hashtags for the conference. Um, hashtag build number four scale and hashtag faith conference. So you can take as many pictures as possible, upload them on Instagram, upload them on Twitter, and let's get this hashtag rolling because we want as many people as possible to know about this amazing conference that's going on. You, have, you had seven years of education with your mentor at the time. And that has stood you in good stead, along with all the other wonderful attributes that you have acquired. I learned so much from what you said, but I have one question before I begin to go through other people's questions. What major mistake, what major mistake did you ever make in business and how were you able to overcome it? Um, hmm. this is a very serious question. I've made several mistakes. <clears throat> um, life is about, you can't grow without making mistakes. If you ever get worried about doing things wrong, you will never be productive in life. Um, we have to fall several times before we climb up. One of the major 
mistake I've made, serious major mistake I made, was um, in 2011. I was in my office and a young man from my village called me and said um, he want me to please uh, come to see what he's doing. And um, I tried to ask him why. He convinced me to come. I like to inspire people. So I went. And when I went, I went with my wife. And I was fascinated about the things he was doing. And he told me his story. To cut it short, I took his word for it without having a second check and avail him about over $200 million. And he screwed me. And this money was money I took from bank. I actually asked bank to lend him that money. So it was a difficult situation. I've never believed. I used to proud myself and beat my chest and said, if anybody succeeds to dupe me, I will congratulate the person. Because even my mother, when she says something to me, I try to investigate and make sure that whether what she's telling me is from her heart or somebody had told her something to tell me. So 21 billion naira crystallized in my account, yielding interest of 300 million every month. It's like a man breathing to death. If you don't stop that breed, you can die. Um, it's the most difficult challenge I've ever met in my life, but if you also want to know, it's the best test I've ever met in my life. And I will explain it in a short word. You never know who you are until you see what you can do. Andy, you can only know who you are if you do something that you know nobody will find out you do otherwise but you do the correct thing. I didn't sign any paper in the bank when that money was given and it crystallized. All my board members said forget it. We will not you know ruin Koscharis because of this. After all the LC was not opening Koscharis name. We didn't sign any paper. This has nothing to do with us. You know, the bank gave the money. They should carry their responsibility. The guy who we gave the money is willing to, to, to buy. And we finished the board meeting. Everybody left. But I asked myself another strong question. Did the bank give this guy money because of his merit, or do they give him money because of me? And the answer was clear. Obvious, they gave him money because of me. And all my life, I preached integrity. And I was subjected to this test. I called the managing director of the bank. I said, send me that paper. And he sent me the paper, and I signed it. I went home that day. I jumped up. Oh, I won. I won. I won. My wife said, you won? Where's the rotary? When did you become a gambler? What did you win? I said, I won. She asked me again. I said, I won. He said, what do you mean? Please be serious. I said, I signed that paper. She screamed, say, you signed? I said, yes, I signed. Um, I used to own about 25% in one of the financial institutions in Nigeria. I sold everything I have there and paid that debt. I have a peace. I did not breach integrity. That's my greatest trial and that's my greatest mistake. <laughs> My admiration for you has risen beyond this roof. Well done, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I am now going to questions from the audience. Some of you, your writing is like the writing of... <laughs> of the doctor. <laughs> of the doctor, but I will try my best. If your business is already, if your business is already over-leveraged, how do you build your own capital and or get creditors' credit, credibility to build upskill? 
and remain in business. It's wrong for you to build a business that is over leveraged because that's an average problem young people, especially people from my area, have. We over trade. Many of us don't set out to go and cheat people, but you overstretch yourself when you are in a hurry to grow. You take short time fund and invest them into long time project. It won't be long. You are start struggling. You are not meeting up your obligation. At that point, nobody wants to lend you money. If you really want to know the secret, uh, let bank know you don't need their money. Let them pursue you to lend you your, their money. If you if anybody you, you tell you need this thing so much, is careful to give it to you. So when you are already over leveraged, that's the time nobody wants to. People feel that you're already in a big a, a big hole that dragging you out, they may also get sunk and they, they leave you alone on your own. So I advocate enduring success, as I said earlier, is not a product of chance. It's characterized by a structured and well-planned organization. You need to plan for growth. Don't borrow more money than the capital you have. People can do it and succeed, and many people are doing it succeeding, but you are not anything better than any gambler because it's either you make it big time or you crash forever. You can sustain growth by gradually growing, borrowing a money you can discount. If the wars come to us, you quickly pay off that money and trade it off over a period of time. I've never support anybody taking more money than he has capacity to manage or that his business can take. So if, if you're already there, you need to find a way to walk yourself back because in a situation like this, you, you may, bank may continue to support you, but you have actually made yourself a slave. You can work for them for the next 10 years, working to pay bank interest and giving them money, and you have organization that people thought something is out of it, but you are a slave to bankers because every year they clean off everything you earn. That's my answer. Thank you, sir. I think I'm one of the few people in the hall who remember the value of 200 Naira in 1975. That's right. Because um, I remember in 1978, my brother gave me 100 Naira. It was his whole month's salary and um, as a school sat holder. And I valued it a lot. But um, obviously, Nigeria has passed through a lot of regimes as far as the value of our currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar has been. My question is this. Knowing that your business is um, involved in foreign exchange, I mean, there's a lot of foreign exchange components in your business, how have you been able to as they say, duck and dive, how have you been able to turn and move with the devaluation of the Naira? Because, I mean, since then, it's gone through quite a lot of change. Okay, let me start from where you made a reference. 200 Naira in 1976 is still less than 400 US dollars. The highest our currency got was one Naira was $1.88, less than two, uh, 12 cents you get $2. So it's still less than $400. So it's a pretty small amount of money. Yes. If you don't know what you are doing, you can also spend it in one day. Yes. Um, our currency has gone through a lot of devaluation. It's all subject to the business we are doing. Take, for instance, people like me who are in automobile, auto component. You know, just a few years ago, five years ago, we moved into agriculture. We, in fact, our farm just got flooded. We, we had over 3,000 hectares of land that our farm in Anambra State. Um, but the thing we are doing before, you are keeping a product. That product is at a value. So when exchange rate change, you revalue the product. So in, in actuality, it is the, the consumers that are taking the heat more than business people. Because if whatever you have, is, is valuable. 
the risk you taking are just the goods you sold on credit because they are not going to repay you on a revalued rate. But if the merchandise are still with you, you can always revalue them in the currency of today. So you still have um, the same amount of money relatively to whatever the rate uh, is today. And that's how we've been able to manage. It actually has never been an issue to us, but it has been an issue to a lot of people. In fact, if we want to put it for an LA man on the street from 2014 to now has been over... 100% poorer than he was before. Because if you are earning 150,000 Naira, when exchange rate was uh, uh, 165 Naira, and today's exchange rate is 365 Naira, 100% of it is uh, 330, but it's 365, and you are still earning 150. So you are already like 100% poorer than you were, because that is how the price of things has been multiplied back in the market. So the, 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 that is the problem in the country. Rather than the, the government taking people out of poverty, they are pushing more people back into poverty in the last five years, which Thank is you, unfortunate. Sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. A question from the audience. It says, we are witnessing the emergence of strong, small-scale multinational companies from Nigeria establishing presence in other African countries. Do you think these SMEs have a future in these places? How successful has Koscharis been in the African expansion? Yes. Um, I used to sit in the board of Access Bank, and when we had the program of uh, Africa, whatever, I usually tell I can have that. I say, can you hasten slowly? Um, some of the African countries are very, very small economy, and um, it really, um, some of them are small. But I moved into, we moved into Ghana over 20 years ago, um, where many Nigerian companies are not there. In fact, if you are coming to Ghana, if you are flying by air, you will see Koschari's building, if you fly by the air. We had a common word with Central Bank. Somebody took me to Ghana to go and buy to a gold field. As we were moving on the street of Ghana, I was looking at leaking cars, smoking, and all of that. I drove with my BMW. The following day, he said that he came in the morning, let us go. I told him I'm ready to go back to Nigeria. And he was wondering why. I said, I find another gold field. So, why am I going to inside bush for something I don't know? And there's already gold field that I saw. So I went back to Ghana and established my motor, motor spear pass uh, business. It's a good art. Um, then many of the products are regulated. So I was competing with Shell, Mobile, and big companies who have so much overhead. And that gave me opportunity to do things in an efficient way with a, a lean organization and I made a success. Quite a number of them has made a success. It's not been the same testimony I have for Ghana that I have in Gabon. We're also in Ivory Coast. Uh, some of the French-speaking country has some challenge with the language and their policy uh, is not as an English-speaking country. I will advocate, eventually we shut down the Access Bank uh, at, of Côte d'Ivoire, you know, because of the same we are still in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, that's I'm talking about Koscharis. But my Ghana outfit has been a major success. As a matter of fact, where we are in Ghana is bigger than where I started in Mazamaza in Lagos here. And we're having a good uh, uh, run for our money. And we had product that's been tested and accepted in the market. And so it's, it's an opportunity, you know. Uh, the real truth is that if the ECOWAS system has worked, we have 350 million market to work with. So if you can establish yourself in some of those things before it happens, it makes life even much better and easier for you. So it's something I can encourage you. But before advancing that, why not be sure you have a strong footing in Nigeria that if you have a problem in those places, you can discount it. If you are still struggling here, Nigeria provides opportunity, frankly, none other African country provide for you. You know, the, the Lagos alone is entire Ghana, you know, Lagos alone. And so why are you in a hurry to move into other country where you've never done something that you tested and you can have confidence about in this place? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. 
Another question from the audience. Raising capital for a business in Nigeria is very difficult, especially where the barriers give high interest rates. The banks give high interest rates and the country does not have venture capitalists. How does a young entrepreneur raise capital? Okay. It's basically the same thing I have said to you before. Capital is not something that falls from heaven. Um, if truly, if you are an entrepreneur, the first thing you do, you create capital because if you want to know the truth, every one of us here are little creators. So uh, how do you create capital? Is have a knowledge of what you want to do and demonstrate to anybody that this thing you know is visible and there's an, a substance out of what you are talking about. Uh, I've never seen any good business that you cannot finance. Many times you struggle financing business that are speculative in nature, that has no, no, time, no, no, no substance. So if you have a business that have no substance, you are the person who need to prove to people that this thing work. Even till tomorrow, if you come to me today or anybody and show the person, look, I didn't, my capital didn't fall from heaven. I struggled. 200 naira is not what I built cost charities. I've been in about five partnerships before I established cost charities. There was somebody I met one day. Yeah. Struggling as a young man, at a time, I met somebody to say, if you give me 5,000 naira, I will make it 10,000 by the end of the year. It may not sound something big to you, but that is 100% return on investment. That's what it means in one year. The person knew I was doing something and can relate to the things I was doing. And he dared me and gave me 5,000 naira. That year, I made 18,000. The total money, actually, I grew the total cash to 18,000. The same thing I'm telling you about integrity, I went back to him and made the account to him. I told him the whole money was 18,000. He didn't believe me. That man would have been 50% owner of Costadis today. What he said is that if what I'm telling him is true, I should bring back the first thousand he gave me and I should return, give him additional 5,000, I should take the rest. I did something smart. I went back to his house that evening and I went with only 8,000 naira. I said, this is the 5,000 you gave me originally. This is 3,000. But give me three more moons to turn my business around so that the goose is not absolute. I will return you the other 2,000. He said, yeah, this is about 60% return on his investment. And in three months, I went and gave him back his uh, 2,000. I completed the money, 10,000. That year I ended, I made 36,000 from that money. In the second year of it, I made 360,000. So, you, if you have something doing that people can relate to, that you can articulate and explain it to somebody and say, I started this thing from here, this is where it is now. I can grow it further. It's suffering for cash. There are a lot of people who have money who are earning 8% or 10% in the bank and they will be willing to venture into your business. But they want to see where are you coming from. Not that you jump out of school. You tell him I just finished uh, an entrepreneur school and my head is scattering now. If you give me 10 million, I will make it 100 million. Nobody would do that. If that person did that, his sense is not correct. Thank you. That you've actually answered two questions in one because the next question was, how do I know I am investor ready? So that, that's the answer. Thank you very much, sir. I have another question here. I mean, this is because your own um, speech involved practical and even home front issues. 
So one of the questions here says, if you're in business with your spouse, but you find that your spouse is laid back and you have to do everything and you have equal shares. Oh, sorry. You have to do everything, but he wants equal shares. What do you do? That's not an issue. Whether she, she can't even do anything. She's your wife. Both of you have agreed to marry. So I, I think he's a man in this situation. Eh? I think he's a man. He's a man. Okay. That is the spouse that is laid back. Okay. It's the same thing. Either way. Once you say, I marry you, you marry him or her for everything. And that's why I tell people, don't be in a hurry to say, I, I do. do. Don't be in a hurry. Don't say, let me help this man. Let me help this man. No, it is a long time I've been, I've been moving with him. If I don't marry him now, it will look like he gets as he be. Because, because, because you are making the most important decision in your life. It's, you don't marry people out of sympathy. And if you love a man or a woman to marry him, if you are the person, and I can also tell you this so that you can get it right. After I got married with my wife, his parents doesn't want us to get married. Not his parents, his uncle. And his uncle's problem is that this boy, you know, you can imagine, this is actually on Sunday last two, and Sunday two days ago was my 40th anniversary. So this young man has been married for 40 years. I was in church and I saw this beautiful young lady dark in compression. If she smiles, her eyes greet her. It shocks you like electric. <laughs> My pocket was empty, completely empty. I'm not, I'm not 20. I was 18. I raised my hand. I said, Lord, I claim her in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and four or five other men were competing, but my faith was stronger than the rest of all of them. If my grammar is still what it is today, the way it's jamming each other, you can imagine what it is 40 years ago. <laughs> Capital letter, jam small letter. They are, they are, they are moving back and, and like that. My, my ease was jamming my words and they were going left and right. His senior brother was a medical doctor, and his uncle was a medical doctor. And I'm trying to enter. The, if my mother told me, you like to put your hand where you, you like <laughs> to put something where your hand no go reach. When I told her that, I found a lady, asked me who it is. I told him, the person said, please forget it. You are not in that league. But I am a man who saw tomorrow. I knew what is going to be today. And you can imagine, if I am getting married at 19 years plus. I wedded my wife before 20. Yes, by 14, I had a clear vision where I want to go in life. And I wrote them down. One of them is that I will marry before I turn 20. One is that I want to buy my first car before I turn 22. One is that I want to be a millionaire before 24. That's what we talk about vision. I didn't get time to say those things to you. And I wrote them down, and each night before I go to my bed, I pray over them. I got married at 19. Not with, not with ease. Dr. Dozier Ike Dife shot me three times and said, if you see me in that home, you will kill me. He said, what did I do to charity that she listened to me? And to charity, I said, you are, you are silly. How old are you? What, what is making you to think that this man has anything to offer to you? But you didn't know what happened. I am a Christian. I became a Christian at the age of 14. I gave my life to Christ. And this young lady was going back to school. I was giving her a lift. And I jammed the brake of the car. And her boss hit me at the back. She turned to me and said, since when? I said, since what? He said, since when? He asked me a question, looking straight into my eyes. And she got down and got offended and walked back. I said, she's expensive. If I die, I will marry her. Whatever it costs me, I will get it. Make these things difficult for some young men so that you know whether they truly love you or not. Not be in a hurry like you are left over. The question, yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem. 
make it difficult for some of them. It was a hill tax. We got married. As a matter of fact, I told people yesterday on Sunday, I said, my wife senior me by one year. And one of you will ask, why did I say it? I say it because I am proud of her. If I have opportunity, I will marry her all over again. Um, the real point is that if you marry a man or a woman, it's for better, for worse. Everything you have is that person. My wife supported me. When I lost my capital, she took a job and she was earning 85 naira. And she brings it back home and I decide what to do with it. It doesn't make me... She, when things went back because I am a man who believed in dignity of labor. I went to one we market. I dropped a scale. If somebody crammed it, I collect 10 kobo. Scale somebody brought for me during our wedding time. I would like to walk. People were laughing. I said, it's premature. They are laughing. It's too quick. They should wait and see what the future will be. So nobody didn't go difficulties. If you need to support your husband, please support him. And make him feel dignified in supporting him. Don't ever make, because man has ego. If you want to get the best of your man, praise him every day. Tell him there's no man like him. That it is him you are depending upon, even though you are giving him food. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I ask one question and I get like 10 answers. Thank you so much, doctor. We're, we're rounding up now. I have another question here. But obvi it's obvious that his approach to business is his approach, was the same approach to marriage, obviously. So for those of you that are not yet married, you know what to do. Question, how do you deal with, com with corruption and bribery requests from the person said government officials, but I don't think it's just government officials. So I'm just going to say, how do you deal with corruption and bribery? Okay. All of us go through the same thing. Corruption is a cancer. How do you describe a cancer? It's a growth in a body that sees the blood vein and suck the blood, make himself to grow. And when he grows, he's growing inside the body. When is continue to grow, the body die, that cancer cell die inside the body. We need to get rid this country of corruption. But I will explain it so that you can understand because many times people ask me, you mean you don't give people money? How do you manage in Nigeria of today? Initially, it was very difficult when you are starting small. What I consider a bribe is where I give you money to induce you to do what I want you to do. But there's what we call extortion. Extortion is where you use your position to make me do things against my will. Even though I had that, an umbrella met an Igbo man and say your car or your money. He said, let me think about it. <laughs> uh, but the real truth is that you don't need to think about it you should let him take the car so you can work hard. But if you put a gun on my head and say my life or my money, I tell you, take the money now. The money does not hold me. Who I am is in me. You take that one go, I can be able to work hard and maybe create something else. But when you grow, get your business to a certain level, you have muscle to shout and to negotiate. And I am sure you will not believe this to be truth. I will actually advise you, don't build, part of the thing I didn't say before, don't build your business against government contract. That's a wrong model. You can make money out of it, but if you truly want to believe me, I will, you will be more independent if you create a business that stands on its own. Public or the day Afternoon or sort of day, government come or no come, because soldier goes, soldier come, Balak will remain, so that you create something on your own that you can be independent of. You can't build your business on such systems. Let me answer the question now, and I drop the microphone. The question you ask is, how do I deal with it? I deal with it today effortlessly. Nobody can put me the search I arrived today. 
If I tell you there's a job worth 86 million dollars I won last year, I never spoke to anybody. I didn't discuss with the head of the, the department or anybody, but I won it purely on merit and what I believed in. Now, if I finished doing this job and decided to show an appreciation, that's not corruption. That's my own decide. This is my own decision. Because I have even done it to some people and said, you are embarrassing me. Why do you want to do this? You didn't ask me. I said, but you didn't ask me for money. But it's a different thing. If I have consignment in the port and a custom officer knew that I'm importing piston ring for automobile and he go and quote tariff of the ring that is in the hand and tell me that this is the head tariff and that I have to pay 85% duty and I'm arguing with him the Dumoridge is accruing on my goose and he's taking his position because he knows he's never going to be disciplined anyhow. We can stay there for three months. If I don't give him money, I'm not a smart business person. Because it's, it, what he asks, I give him so I can carry my consignment and go away. Because I, while I'm waiting, the bank interest rate is also accumulating and the, 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 the possibility of me defaulting on the transaction. So it's relative what you have in mind by this question. But I've tried to answer it in many ways so you can choose if you fit what you have in mind. God bless you. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that was wonderful. That was a lot of wisdom. And for those who are wise, you'll be able to pick from that. This brings to an end the question and answer session. But... I would like to say, anywhere I hear that you are speaking, Dr. Maduka, as long as they allow people to enter, I will be there. Thank you, sir. <laughs>